Paphos has lovely, relaxing beaches, but we knew little about the darker side of Cyprus. There's the Green Line, the ghost town of Arosha, and more. Welcome back to Find Jean Marie, where we share our lives as full-time travelers and the connections we make along the way. If you're new here, welcome. I'm Judy. And I'm Kevin. Come along with us on two very different day tours. The first is a food tour beginning with halloumi cheese making in the Trudos Mountains. Next, journey north with us to the monastery and tomb of St. Barnabas, to the ancient kingdom of Salamis, and then learn all about the tension that splits this island nation. We started by boarding a Cyprus taste tour bus with our tour guide and seven other people to go to the Trudos Mountains and learn about making cheese and tasting wine and having a few other treats as well. The Trudos Mountain range spans Larnaca, Limassol, Paphos, and Nicosia. These rural villages of Cyprus are world renowned and we'll show you why. Okay, let's talk about halloumi cheese making. We started off by going to a small family owned business to look at how they make halloumi cheese. And get our hands dirty too. So what is halloumi cheese? It's a traditional Cypriot semi-hard pasteurized cheese that's salty, squeaky, and doesn't melt. Here in Cyprus, it's made with a mixture of goat and sheep milk. To be called halloumi, it must be made in Cyprus, similar to champagne, whose grapes must be grown in the Champagne region of France. To make halloumi, milk is heated, and then we added rennet to it. It only takes a small amount for this large vat, less than a quarter cup, and that's what helps curds to form. Once cooled, the curds are separated from the whey, and the curds are left to firm up, after which they're poached in whey with a little salt, and then kept in brine to preserve the cheese. While we were waiting, we enjoyed some tasty Cypriot coffee, which was very similar to Turkish coffee. There's a layer of sludgy grounds at the bottom of your cup. Yeah, we learned that in Egypt. Don't try to drink it to the last drop. We include a step-by-step -step recipe with pictures for making halloumi in the description below. While we were waiting for the halloumi to cook, we were offered a bit of anari, which is a soft curd-like cheese that is similar to ricotta. Yeah, it's made from the remnants of the whey that was used to make the halloumi. It's typically eaten warm for breakfast with sugar and cinnamon, but people add honey or carob syrup as well. It kind of reminded me of porridge. Yeah, not my favorite meal, so I wasn't all in on this. I don't know, it was warm and it was kind of a cold day. Clearly I was wearing a heavy jacket while we were making the halloumi, so I kind of liked how warm and cozy it made me feel. After a little snack, we donned hair nets again. We got to go back into the room where they were cooking the cheese and actually create our own portions of halloumi cheese, which meant get some halloumi out of the bin. Uh, it's still wet and sopping. Put it in these strainers, get all the moisture out we possibly could. Then we actually got to individually grab each one out and like squeeze it. Just to try to remove as much whey as we could. How about a smile for the camera? Yeah, that's it. Very good. While we were waiting for the halloumi to set and continue to drain, we took a little road trip to taste some carob syrup, olive oil, and three glasses of wine. And they weighed the same. All the countries that had carobs, it was a way of measuring, especially the gold. We got to taste several carob syrup types, which is also known as black gold in Cyprus. That's because of its health properties as a high fiber, anti-inflammatory superfood. People sometimes drizzle it on halloumi and it's also used for meat marinades. They had all these products available there for purchase. Of course, there was no pressure to buy anything, but they were very friendly and very nice to spend time with. We traveled back to the home where we were making the halloumi and we got to have a sit down, a little tasting of all our halloumi cheeses, uh, the various foods that went along well with it. And there were multiple kinds of halloumi and even stuffed in some hand pies made with anari, a whole smorgasbord of delicious traditional foods. It was just before Easter, so our guide brought us an Easter dessert called Faluna to go along with our meal. We also asked our guide if this was a cheese that they sold in stores. She said this is a small family run operation and they actually just sell to locals. They all know them, they buy everything they make, so they have no need to distribute in supermarkets. Our next stop was to the Greek Chrysoroya Tisa Monastery, which was founded in 1152. The current building has been around since 1770. It provides panoramic views of Cyprus's Mount Olympus and vineyards. Four monks are still in residence here. This monastery produces a version of the world's oldest wine still in production. The dessert wine commandaria has origins going back to 3000 BC or earlier. The wine we tasted here is called Monte Roya. 
Afterwards, we traveled to Lemina Paphos, where we got a wine production and bottling tour at the Sangoritas Winery. After our tour of the winery, we got to sit down on their beautiful terrace and have uh, seven glasses of wine <laughs> with our fellow tour mates and really chat and get a chance to bond a little bit. Yeah, we probably could have used a charcuterie board to balance out all the delicious glasses of wine, but luckily we had our tour guide as our designated driver. Our sweet day ended with a stop at Aphrodite Delights for some delicious Lukomi Gyroskupo. If you've ever read the book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis, where Edmund was in Narnia, he ate several pounds of this delicious treat, which he referred to as Turkish delight. They're more appropriately known by their Greek name, Lukomi Gyroskupo. Some people also refer to them as Cyprus delight to counter the Turkish conflict in Cyprus that we'll talk about more on our next tour. But regardless of what they were called, we now know what all the fuss was about. And I honestly didn't know there were this many flavors. They look like small rectangular cubes of jello, but they're made simply with starch and powdered sugar and flavored with every flavoring you could imagine. They're very fun. Our day with Cypress Taste Tours was one of the best tours we've been on, and Elena was a great host. Yeah, it was super well curated. Elena took photos of everything and then sent them to us later, along with restaurant recommendations, historical information, and at the end of the tour, we even got a small parting gift of pastelaki, nut brittle, sweetened with carob syrup. This tour cost us 110 euro per person, plus tip. If you're interested in finding out more about this tour, there's a link in the description below. The second tour was a much longer bus ride all across Cyprus from our point in Paphos to the district of Famagusta. You're required to bring your passport on this tour because Famagusta is occupied by the Turkish military. Our guide pointed out a brown cut area of grass to the left. Well, the post. This is the line, huh? The line separating the two communities. The houses just beyond that area are abandoned, but still owned by the Greeks who were displaced from that area and now mostly living on the south side of the road. They can see their abandoned homes, but they can't return to them because of the Turkish military presence. In 1974, there was a coup to overthrow the president. Five days later, Turkey responded by invading Cyprus. The UN Security Council was able to obtain a ceasefire, but in the next few months, Turkey invaded a second time. The second invasion displaced 150,000 Greek Cypriots. 60,000 Turkish people living in southern Cyprus moved to the north. So where do things stand now? The UN is keeping the peace at this point. There's a neutral zone or ceasefire strip of land between the north and south. It's called the Green Line. It's named that because the line was drawn on a map with a pencil with green lead. Turkish Cypriots are in the north, called Northern Cyprus, and they use Turkish liras as their money. Turkey recognizes this part of Cyprus as the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. But the international community does not acknowledge what Turkey has done. Greek Cypriots are in the south, which is called Cyprus, and their currency is euros. We didn't have a chance to visit, but Nicosia is a city east of Famagusta that straddles the Green Line. You'll need to go through Border Patrol and present your passport to cross over into Turkish Cyprus. You can spend a full day or longer touring this area, and it's definitely worth doing, and we're really sad that we didn't have a chance to do it. We mentioned in a previous video about Cyprus, which we've linked below, that most recently it was ruled by Great Britain up until 1960. Great Britain still has two military bases here called Sovereign Base Areas. Before getting to the Turkish border, we first have to pass through the British military base to Kilia. Next, we stop at the Turkish border in Stravelia, a small village in the district of Famagusta. Uh, the Turkish government controls the border crossing, but there's also a presence from the UN peacekeeping force in Cyprus and the British military. It's a bit unnerving, but it's part of the process and everyone has to hand over their passports as one big group for border patrol to review, and it takes forever. There's a lot of complicated emotions that are happening with the Cypriots. There's a lot of lost homes. There's, there's anger over what's happened. Certainly not a quiet, casual crossing of the border. It felt pretty serious all the time. One example of this is the ghost town of Barosha, which we'll show you at the end of this video. We were a bit surprised that after we crossed the border, we had to make a stop, and that was to pick up a Turkish escort who had to remain with us throughout our travel in occupied northern Cyprus. With our guide on board, we stopped in the Acropolis of Salamis to see the Church of St. Barnabas. His tomb also is here, and the church now is an icon museum. 
Barnabas was a Cypriot Jew and one of the earliest followers of Jesus. The Christian tradition holds that he was martyred in Salamis and Barnabas appeared in a dream to the Archbishop of Cyprus and revealed to him the place of his body beneath a carob tree. The following day, the Archbishop found the tomb and inside it were the remains of Barnabas. The church was found around 478 AD. It was built near the spot where St. Barnabas' body was discovered. This holy part of the tomb are part of the original monastery of the fourth century. Only a short distance past this are the Salamis ruins, which were built in 1100 BC. Back then it was the capital of Cyprus and later became an ancient Roman city. The city was destroyed by an earthquake in 76 AD. You can see that many of the statues are headless. And that's because when Christianity was adopted as the state religion, any pagan symbols were destroyed or defaced. Some of the mosaics are partially destroyed as well during the process. All of the ruins are very close to one another, so it was only a short walk to the amphitheater. The columns in the background are a gymnasium where athletes used to train. Here in the foreground is the amphitheater where the athletes used to actually have contests. It also was used as a theater and they had Greek tragedies as well as comedies. They also would fill the center with water and make a swimming pool out of it and gladiators would fight against each other. And they would also have pools that they would fill with alligators and the gladiators would fight with them as well. The auditorium as it stands right now is restored to 20 rows of seats. It used to be 60 rows, three times the size that it is today. Our last stop is the ghost town of Verosha, which at one point was considered the Riviera of the Eastern Mediterranean. Walking through this ghost town felt really eerie and very dystopian. It's not actually haunted though. Remember the history lesson we gave you earlier about Turkey invading Northern Cyprus in 1974? Tens of thousands of Greek Cypriots abandoned their homes suddenly as troops were invading the area. Our Turkish escort allowed us to go through a security checkpoint to walk through the abandoned city, so it's still guarded. But people left in such a panic that they still had pots cooking on their stoves and dinner on the table. They intended to return once tensions settled down, but the Turkish military stepped in, fenced off the area, and the city became a ghost town, frozen in time, exactly as everything was in 1974. It's only a recent change that the UN has been able to negotiate with Turkey to allow tourists to walk through it. The city previously was a playground for wealthy Europeans. It had glamorous shopping districts and some of the best beaches in Cyprus. It was an important trading hub thanks to its deep harbors. But as we said, now everything is frozen in the year 1974. Most of the buildings have fallen into disrepair or are vandalized or looted by the Turkish military. As you can see, there's some warning signs on the various buildings that they may collapse and they're not safe due to lack of maintenance. Once we walked through the city, we could see that there are beautiful beaches and five-star hotels all along it, but everything is vacant. This water is incredibly blue and vibrant. And you can see the ghost town of what used to be active luxury buildings. And I feel like such a waste of beautiful coastline and opportunities for in people to enjoy nature and the sand and uh, I don't know, this is a very tragic situation. Snapshot of 1974, basically. Yeah. It's like walking through a post-apocalyptic movie, but it's real life. There are a lot of strong feelings about this abandoned town, especially among Greek Cypriots who may have had to leave in a hurry or who had family who had to leave and abandon their homes and not have been able to return, and even those who had family members who died during this conflict. Our guide told us that the Turkish military uses the excuse that they are protecting these homes or the Cypriots when they return. The current situation is that everyone is maintaining the status quo. Greek Cypriots can't go back and Turkey can't move in or develop it. So basically everything will remain abandoned. Although this was a very sobering tour, it was fascinating. We learned so much about an area that we really had very little knowledge of at all. It's 
somewhat embarrassing that we didn't know this information before, but I think that's been one of the benefits of traveling full time is to have this opportunity to learn more and make greater connections with our world at large. As for our costs, this tour was run by a company called Qualiday and cost 80 euro per person. We tipped the driver as well as the guide during it. We didn't love that it was a huge bus and we wasted a lot of time picking up and dropping off passengers. It would have been much better to have this as a small group tour in our opinion. Thanks for joining us. We would really love to have you subscribe if you're not already. And let us know what you thought about this episode in the comments below. Also check out findgenemarie.com where you can read Judy's journal. Lots of great information, lots of wonderful articles. Until next time. Until next time. The first is a food tour, believe don't, maybe don't look at me. My part of your problem. I don't know. You're, you're <laughs> dazzling beauty. <laughs> no, you're on camera. <laughs> I can't believe you just did that. Well, you know, I have to do something. <laughs> no, you didn't need to do that at all. Mm -hmm. No, you didn't. <laughs> That's how it works. We have to trade off. <laughs> Rude. Yeah.